Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Professor Malcolm Evans about his book titled Tackling Torture, Prevention in Practice, published by Bristol University Press in 2023. This is a, I think, very important book. Um, There's loads packed into quite a concise bit of writing to help us understand how big a problem is torture, what is being done at the international level to prevent it, what could further be done um, within the existing system. So this covers rather a lot of ground, um, and I'm so pleased, Malcolm, that you're here to take Take us through the book and your massive expertise. Well, thank you. And it's delightful to have the opportunity. Before we get into your book, um, I'm hoping that maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and explain why you decided to write this. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm currently the principal, the head of um, Regent's Park College here in Oxford. Uh, I recently took up that position, having been professor of public international law at the University of Bristol in the UK for approaching 35 years. I was um, head of the law school, dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Law, Um, but for many years as an academic, I was quite intimately involved in research concerning torture and torture prevention. And also, building on that, was elected some years ago to be a member of what was then a a fairly new United Nations human rights treaty body, in fact the largest of them, um, the terribly titled Subcommittee for Prevention of Torture. This was the UN treaty body established under the Uh, again, another terrible title, a thing called the OPCAT, the Optional Protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture. No one has ever accused the United Nations of having um, snappy titles for instruments. And for 10 years, I was chair of that um, body. And really, the purpose of writing the book was to step back a little and reflect on those 10 years of work very much I think I can say, at the front line of trying to tackle torture with the UN, but also doing it in a way which is not the same way as other UN human rights treaty bodies work. And so for me, what was interesting and important about it was not only what we learned about tackling torture through the book, but what also we learned about how perhaps the UN and others could do better about trying to deal with human rights abuses more generally. This particular book, you said it's it's quite concise, and I'm glad that you said that. I, I think it is. Um, as an academic I've written many books, articles on torture. What I wanted to do with this book was to write something, frankly, that was a little bit more of a personal account. Perhaps I needed to do this after the length of time I'd spent working on the the committee. But what I really wanted to do was to, if you like, go beyond the normal academic critiques and perhaps unusually for an academic, let a little bit of me come through, um, speaking in the first voice and trying to, yes, trying to work out how I responded to what I I saw and felt across those years of, 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 of working in this field. Thank you for that introduction and sort of background of the book. I think it really helps um, to know kind of how you came into this project to understand um, what's covered in the book itself, which we will, of course, now turn to. Um, Tackling anything requires, of course, being able to define what the thing is that you are tackling. And as with many things in international law, um, torture what exactly that means, what exactly the definition of that is perhaps unsurprisingly not the easiest thing to pin down. Um, Even with that expectation, though, I was intrigued to read in the book just how tricky it is to define a legal definition of torture. Why? Well, why indeed? I think there's a lot going on around this topic. Um, At one level, 
it's not that tricky to come up with a legal definition. Um, the difficulty is, is coming up with a good legal definition and a legal definition that that works. Of course, we have got a legal definition. Um, it's set out in the United Nations Convention for the Prevention of Torture. And in, and in essence, it says that torture requires to be to have four key elements. It must involve severe, and the word is significant, severe pain and suffering. It must be inflicted for a purpose. It must be intentional. And it must also be inflicted by a person person, um, acting in a public capacity or on the basis of public authority or under some form of public authority. And in a sense, there, there you have it. What we might say is the, the classic traditional idea that springs to people's mind when we, when we think about torture, that we can see some sort of room in which some vulnerable person by some official, some security apparatus, policing, secret interrogators is purposely questioning someone and applying terrible pain to them in order to get them to answer questions. And of course, this is often very, very true. Um, But as much of the book is pointing out, a great deal of torture is not really like this at all. And one of the problems, I think, with the approach that we have to torture is it puts out there an image of torture, which whilst true, whilst shockingly true, only represents a small portion of the type of torture that takes place and therefore what can be done about it. But returning to that definition itself, it also sets a terribly high threshold. Each of those terms, what is severe pain and suffering, purpose, public authority and so on and so forth, what do they mean? Now, these are, of course, standard normal legal questions. And in a sense, in this context, I think it's quite right that they should be asked. After all, this has been put forward by the United Nations in the Convention Against Torture as a model for a criminal law definition, which states are meant to reflect in their domestic legal systems. In other words, this is what needs to be fulfilled if a person is going to be held criminally responsible to the highest standards and punished for having committed an act of torture. And so, as with all criminal law definitions, there will always be debates about what they mean, but they should set a a high threshold, and it's right that that's the case. But, and this is the big but... Human rights law outlaws and prohibits torture. It doesn't only prohibit torture, it prohibits torture in human and degrading treatment and punishment. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, all things, all these set out a prohibition on torture in the same way as there are also going to be you know, restrictions on freedom of assembly, um, Um, freedom of expression, things which are protected but also restricted, etc., etc. But when it comes to torture, inhuman and degrading treatment and punishment, the prohibition is absolute. So we have an absolute prohibition, but not just on torture, but on these other things as well. But just like with all human rights prohibitions, it doesn't carry with it a definition. It's meant to be setting a standard that we then try to fill in in other ways. And I think one of the difficulties that we have with our understanding of torture is that a human rights prohibition, no one shall be subject to torture in human and degrading treatment, has become overly bound up with these legal elements of a criminal law definition. And so what that means is that we, we, we've we seen it so often. We end up with these great long debates about whether or not the way in which a person has treated has been sufficiently severe to make it an act of torture or whether it is only an example of pain and of a lower level of pain and suffering so that it is only inhuman treatment as if somehow inhuman treatment is better than being tortured, um, when in fact both are prohibited in, in exactly the same way. And so this sort of strange combination of confusing a 
a criminal law legal definition of of torture for the purposes of holding individuals criminally to account has sort of got confused in people's minds and in legal minds with the absolute prohibition on torture as a matter of human rights law. And this then has opened up the space for these really rather insidious and difficult discussions about whether something is serious enough to be torture when the only thing that we actually know about is that it's actually prohibited anyway. But the very nature of that discussion opens the space for the prohibition to be flouted. And it doesn't help either that again over the years human rights law itself has tended to think about torture in exactly that way, seeing it as somehow Um, being at the pinnacle of pain and suffering. And so there is this whole body of quite confused legal and conceptual relationships about what we're actually talking about when we're talking about torture. You know, arguably the the human rights prohibition on torture has been come to be understood uh, arguably and controversially, you know, too broadly. It now seems to be used for anything which we consider to be inappropriate. But the idea that somehow you can have an absolute prohibition on anything that people feel is, you know, inappropriate is probably too widely cast. But if we just look to see and hold states accountable from a human rights perspective only for those things which fall within the strict criminal law definition that we have um, put out there, then an awful lot of things that we should be taking a lot more seriously just seem to be excused and justified. This is, I think, one of the sections of the book that I most appreciated the combination of your expertise and personal attitude towards it because it is so easy to fall purely into legal I suppose kind of legal wrangling over terminology um, and to be able to kind of step back and go hang on a second this is what that all means this is the impact of that um, is I think a really helpful way to understand why these definitions are so tricky. So thank you for taking us through that. I'd love to turn to OPCAT um, because it is a really interesting UN um, operation, I suppose, despite, of course, the less than catchy title. Can you help us understand how this massive organisation came about? Well, absolutely. Um, And in a sense, it owes its origins to what everyone accepts is the sort of the founding movements, really, of the the contemporary prohibitions and development of work targeting torture. You know, as I said previously, torture in human and degrading treatment is prohibited by the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It's It's probably the most oftenly outlawed prohibition in you know, that exists. Um, it's in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that was adopted in the 1960s. It's sort of uncontroversial as a prohibition, but it was clear a you know, long time ago in the 1970s, um, more evidence came to light to the extent to which it was being routinely flouted at the time, particularly with concerns in South America, but not only in South America. And this led to a great deal of focus on trying to do better and produce new instruments. Ancient history, but it was around that time in the mid-70s that the United Nations adopted its declaration against torture and commenced the process for um, producing Producing the convention I've already mentioned, the UN Convention Against Torture, which establishes this legal definition and the obligation to for all states to make it a criminal offence and punish people who they find who have been committing acts of torture, all of which is, 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 is very right, very proper and very good. But alongside that, and it is important to say alongside that, there were other ideas about what could be done to try to address torture, not only focusing on prohibiting it and focusing on criminalising and punishing those that were responsible for it, but actually, you would say, surely, sort of obviously, for preventing it happening in the first place. 
And I have to say, as a as an international human rights lawyer, the sniffiness that one runs into from so many quarters when one talks about, well, what we should be doing is preventing violations, people tend to think, well, no, we're lawyers. What we do is hold people to account for violations, as if somehow that protects people and their rights. Their right is not to be subject to torture in human and degrading treatment, not the right to, if they are subject to torture in human degrading treatment, have their perpetrators held to account and offer redress. Um, those two are very important if it does occur, but equally important is the idea of trying to do better to make sure it doesn't happen in the first place. And the origins of the what has now become the, the focus on prevention date back to these times and the ideas that first um, grew up in the mid 19 the 70s, largely in Geneva, by those working and inspired by the work of the International Red Cross, who thought, well, if it's possible to have an international legal framework that means that people can go into places where people are being detained in times of war in order to try to find out um, how they're being treated and to offer humanitarian you know, help to them to try to prevent them being the subject of ill treatment. Why is it not possible in times of peace, which you would think should be easier, to once again have an international mechanism that allows individuals to go into places where people are at risk of being tortured and ill treated to do the same sort of thing, to find out how people are being treated and see what could be done about it. And in a sense, it was as simple as that. But like most things which are as simple as that, they often become very much more complicated. And in this particular instance, the idea that states early on would allow allow international observers or international actors to go into places of detention in order to see whether people were being tortured or ill-treated or how those places operate quickly became a non-starter. There was no political um, interest in this indeed quite a lot of political concern about it and so it got it got shelved to cut a very long story short about 25 years later after many false starts and many twists and turns in 2002 the united nations did adopt as an optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture exactly this sort of mechanism and that is what we've um, what, what what we what we have the preventive system that it started off that we have today but i think it's important to stress some of that background because quite often and in my view quite strangely many i have discovered within the human rights movement and world are a little bit <laughs> They somehow find the work of the committee that I chaired rather strange in focusing on prevention, Um, because after all, shouldn't human rights all be about holding people to account? And I think, well, no, shouldn't human rights actually be about doing things to try to make sure that people actually are able to enjoy their rights? And prevention is the oldest adage in the world, prevention is better than cure. But somehow in so many human rights circles, that seems sometimes to have got lost. Hmm. No, a very important point. So thank you for raising that. Now that we have a bit of background of kind of what OPCAT is, was created for and was trying to do, what does that mean on the ground? What does OPCAT actually require in practice? Well, it is in many ways one of the most radical um, instruments that exists and the most powerful within the international human rights sphere. I, I don't mind saying that. I don't mind saying also that sometimes when I've said that, I've been held to task by some people to say, you really shouldn't go around saying that, because if you do, it makes it less likely that other states will join the system. After all, they don't want human rights bodies which are powerful. Um, And that's true too, but it's not going to stop me saying it. What is so powerful about this? Well, it's how it's set up to work. It's got two different elements to it. Um, The first one was the one that was always intended, which was the creation of this international body um, known as the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, which in a nutshell is given by the um, by the optional protocol in respect of what is now a little short of a hundred states around the world have agreed to this, it means that the members of that body, of whom there are 25 elected by the states parties, have got the right 
to visit any of those states' parties, any of those hundred countries, at any time they wish, and having sent a delegation and and, and gone into that country, they have got the right to go to any place in that country where they think someone may be being deprived of their liberty, not just a, a formal prison or a police station or a designated place, but anywhere where they think people might be deprived of their liberty, which is understood to mean anywhere where people are being held and are not free to leave on the basis of public authority and having gone into and having visit uh, going to such place they have got the right to enter at immediately and to see any go to visit any part of that place to travel freely around within it to be able to see any form of documentation any form of c- cupboard content You can open lockers, you can see what you like, and most importantly, you can have access to anybody in that place of detention and have the right to speak to them in full confidence and um, about what, what, what their experience is or what has happened to them in there. So just think about it. The right for an international body, whenever it wishes, to go to anywhere in any of these approaching 100 countries to see precisely what they think may be going on. The potential of this is enormous. And also, if that were not enough, what it also does is require each and every one of those um, th- those states to also establish a similar sort of body with an equally inelegant title called a National Preventive Mechanism, which is entitled to do precisely the same thing at a national level. Because it's one thing having international mechanisms, even in the most ideal world, how often is an international body of this nature going to be able to exercise such a mandate going into countries? With 100 countries, you know, it, it's, going to, it's not going to be able to do it particularly frequently, only once every now and then. But a national body should be able to do this very frequently, and this is also what the OPCAT requires. Independent bodies able to go anywhere within the country where they think people are deprived of their liberty in order to see what is happening to them, and on the back of that, to be able to make recommendations, and not just recommendations, but to engage in dialogue and discussion with those responsible for those places about what needs to be done to make them better. That's pretty powerful. Very much so. Um, And it is, as you highlighted, a massive mandate. How are decisions made about where and when SBT visits occur? Mm. This is where it all gets a little bit, shall we say, um, a little bit more... um, more if only um, <laughs> there is one thing which you know, and again doubtless we'll come on to this later which somehow clouds the you know the horizon on this and that the one is which again for many working in the human rights sphere they find quite surprising if not shocking about this whereas i actually think it is a positive benefit is that the work of the committee in going into the country, not the national ones, but the international one, is confidential. People say, oh, so it's a confidential body, it's a secret body. No, it's not secret. What it is is not secret. There is absolutely nothing under the sun um, confidential about the fact that we visit a country and that we go to particular places of detention. After all, it's terribly visible. We turn up in a car, we go in the front and we knock the door. You know, anybody can see what we're doing. What we are doing is not confidential but what we see in the course of our visits is confidential and the the reports and the recommendations that we produce off the back of them are confidential why well ultimately this is seen by some as the price that has to be paid for having this remarkable power of access is that understandably many states were nervous about what would actually happen if we were then able to you know, just publicise what we found in those places of detention. Um, And so we don't. The reports that we produce under the convention are confidential. They are sent to states. Important consequences flow from this. Um, 
states are able to make those reports public if they wish. And you might think, well, who on earth is going to make public such a report that we might produce? And the answer is probably around about half the states that we visit. They do recognise that making our reports public, and it's their decision, not ours, is important and that we always encourage them to do so. We think it helps within that process. But the very fact that they are confidential and they are not written to be public means that we do not have to, shall we say, think about how they are going to be received in the public domain. What we need to think of is what is most likely to get these states to engage effectively with us when we have gone about one of our visits. And that also then ties into the question that you've just asked about, well, where do we go? Look, you know, when I was on the committee, you know, we are based in, you know, part of the UN human rights apparatus. We are subject to all the lim- the, the advantages and limitations that flow from that. In the real world, a committee of 25 independent experts, we're not paid. It's not our full-time jobs. We have to find the time from other things to be able to do this. There's a small full-time secretariat in Geneva, which supports the work. The funds for doing this have got to be voted by the UN as part of its regular tiny amount of money that it spends on human rights work. Put this all together in the real world. When I first started with the SPT, shockingly, we were only able to do about three visits a year. Three visits a year when there's a mandate of this nature. By the time I left, we were averaging between 8 and 10, which doesn't sound a lot until you start thinking that you were coming from 3 to start off with. So when you have got so few visits at your disposal, it's important to be very strategic, to be very realistic about where you can make a difference. And so where we went to was not... Um, only influenced. We obviously had a lot of countries that we wanted to get around to, but you had to think very hard. Where can we make a difference if we go? Is this going to be a country where us producing a report in confidence is going to be useful because there is um, a government, national authorities with whom we can have a sensible conversation um, about about what comes out of this that's, that realistically is in a position to engage with us over this? Also, those countries which, as I said earlier, had already established effective and functioning national mechanisms within our international system, you could say, well, was there really much point in us going there? It was already being dealt with or addressed by others within the system. Perhaps we should focus on those countries that had failed to establish their national mechanisms and so on. And so there's a whole host of factors that feed into the business about where you went, what you go. The book goes into them in a lot more detail. But the overarching criterion, certainly when I was chair, was always this. Where is it going to be most effective? Where do we think we can make a difference? Whether we could or couldn't, well, we would see. But just going somewhere because you think that you should, rather than because you think it matters or that you could make a positive difference, just seemed to be not the best use of incredibly scarce resources. Mm, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'd love to, on this point of kind of the practical side of can, what is actually going to make a difference? Um, you talk about in the book sort of how you think about the solutions that an SPT suggests. And obviously you've just explained sort of the confidentiality of it and the benefits that that can bring. I was struck in a similar vein by your discussion in the book about kind of what it means to come up with a solution and to what extent is it about kind of here is a script that we follow versus not. Can you talk us through kind of how you approach the solution side of the recommendation? This is sort of one of the advantages of the type of work that we did that brought us face to face with very many of the problems that we were seeking to address. Because I have to say, and I'm speaking against myself as an international lawyer here, um, you know, when you've got international standards and, and positions, the, if you like, the easy thing to do is just to keep repeating them and not 
pay too much attention about whether or not they're really going to make any difference in the situ- you know the, in, in, in practice to the situation that you're going that, that, that you can address you know I you know I, I, I think in the book I gave one example of a situation we were in and it may seem bizarre but it was entirely the case where we were meeting detainees who were suffering terribly because they were never being let out of the of their cell blocks. They were suffering all sorts of skin infections, losing eyesight because of no natural exposure to light. And the international standard is quite clear. Every detainee should be getting outdoor exercise of a given amount every day, which clearly was not happening. And so it would have been very easy for us to turn around and simply say, ensure that all these people are able to exercise their rights to you know 20 you know to at least an hour's outdoor exercise every day and and it would have been absolutely justified for us to do it but when you saw the place you could see that that wasn't the problem the problem was actually a little bit more basic than that it was in a a, a, a very should we say you know poor 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 country where the state of the prisons was in was pretty terrible and if they'd been let out of their cell blocks they would have been free to wander between these these um the different cell blocks there were hardly any guards there at all and you may not believe this but the front gates had dropped off the main perimeter wall so they would have been completely free to walk out it wasn't difficult to see why they were never therefore never let out but repeating an international standard that they really need 20 you know to be let out for an hour a day wasn't going to change it what they really needed bizarrely was a new gate on the prison and you know there's not a known standard that i can think of that when you know human rights people go around prisons we have to check that the front gates are in place um but when you can see that they're not and you can easily see the guard the guards but it was a horrible situation they didn't like it either you know sometimes we think that the authorities and those responsible are you know callous uncaring they, they didn't you know they, they were they, they were horrified at the situation too it didn't make their lives any easier um but the solution was not one that would come from the un playbook of solutions and i think this was you know it's a pretty graphic example i certainly don't want to pretend that that was the sort of thing we ran into all the time but you saw things that were not dissimilar that from time to time where there was a pretty straightforward solution to a problem and um and really what you needed to do was actually do that and then the rest could flow but unless or until that you could keep recommending your standard recommendations for the rest of your life it really wasn't going to make any difference I think that's such a fabulous example to demonstrate this pragmatic side of things. Um, Of course, you can't let prisoners out if that would mean that they can just leave the jail. That defeats the whole purpose of the thing. Um, But understanding that, as you said, on the ground makes quite a big bit of difference. Um, I'd love to pick up on something you briefly just mentioned, kind of the attitude of the guards. Um, In this case going well yeah no we need a gate and we don't like that we don't have a gate and that would help but of course not all guards not all officials um that you encountered in these visits necessarily were so readily in agreement with your recommendations what were some of the most common types of denials or obfuscations or lies that you heard over the course of your visits and discussions with both sort of lower level officials and in some cases it sounds like pretty high up yeah. Um, well, I think they f- <laughs> there's different things going on here. Perhaps surprisingly, you talk about denials. <laughs> it wasn't that often that we ran into point blank denials of of what we were saying. We found lots of excuses for what we saw. And certainly in, in talks, you know, at the end of visits with those we would always normally not always sometimes you think it's just not worth it but that we would normally you know speak with those in authority at the end of the day if we'd been around a place of detention and certainly at the end of the visit we would always meet with groups of national officials and local officials to give them an initial confidential oral debrief about where we were coming from before we went away and produced our our, 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 our full reports. What was striking is very rarely when we did that did anyone turn around and disagree with what we'd said or tell us that we were lying, we didn't understand things, that we were biased, that they were this. And I mention that because when people 
in international fora, and I see it so often in, in UN meetings in, in Geneva and elsewhere, in the General Assembly, in international fora, when someone stands up and, and simply says, this is what is going on in this country, the normal standard response is someone from the other country stands up and says, no, it isn't, you know, you are, you are lying, you are using bias sources, you are this, this is a calumny on our country, you know, X, Y, and Z. You know, it's the standard stuff. We all know that this takes place and we've got our strategies for dealing with it. In country, did that ever happen? I can't say it didn't. Did it happen often? No. What happened more often than most, and I distinctly remember one, I can't name countries because, of course, the countries we visited and many of the visits, the details still remain confidential, but there was one, and at the end of it, given a a fairly... um, a fairly, shall we say, graphic description of what we thought was going on and the problems were. And I remember this very senior person just looking at me and just saying, do you know what? I can't argue with that. (laughs) And I thought, there is no way you would have said that in other fora. And it was really very helpful. It wasn't dismissive. It meant that you could then have a bit of a grown-up conversation rather than just trading accusations about the accuracies of information because they knew there was no point in telling us that what we were saying wasn't true because we'd seen it. We'd been there. And that made all the difference. But it also made the difference on both sides, just as it meant that it was very difficult for the people who we were engaging with to turn around and deny the truth of what we were saying. It also meant that we felt that we just had to be a little bit honest and realistic about what they could do about it, which was often a lot less than, again, you would often think is the case. But clearly, you know, you go into places of detention and there were problems you know we would often be told things that were just not true um, that there was nobody in solitary confinement so there was no point in going to look at the facilities and when you went there there were or indeed you talk say to some oh we've got no punishment cells in this in this place where people are are held and then you talk to the detainees and of course they can tell you precisely where they are and then you go amble that way and then accidentally come across them etc etc um plenty of examples of documentation and books not being available or key staff being quote on leave and they've happened to take in the keys with them so you can't go in that room etc etc these are all sort of low level thing irritating low level and in the end, you, you normally knew how to navigate your way around them. And um, that was, you know, it's just par for the course in, 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 in what you do. It was certainly the case in some places you went to, people would go out of their way to try to hide people from you, not so much in prisons or even in police stations, but when you went to places, for example, where perhaps people shouldn't be beaten. I certainly remember one building we went to in one country where we were pretty sure that people were being improperly kept in the basements and by the time we went in there yep the basements looked exactly like we they'd been described to us with all the telltale signs of recent people having been there being held there recently but not a person in sight um it, there were office blocks on top so you just had a quick walk around the administrative quarters and all of a sudden there were all these people sort of sitting who didn't quite look like other office workers in front of you know in front of desks with com- in front of laptop computers or other papers you know which were not turned on and it was clear that they didn't know what they were doing it was perfectly obvious what would happen um you know i can't say that you know we weren't misled by states on numerous occasions i'm sure we were but if we were we wouldn't know that but there were plenty of occasions when it didn't take much to work out what people were trying to do to pull the wool over our eyes and um Sometimes you didn't give the idea that you knew that this had been the case because it wouldn't be helpful. But quite frankly, we weren't born yesterday. Again, the pragmatic attitude very much comes to the fore. Now that you've helped us understand sort of where all of this came from, um, what the goals are and what this practically looks like, I'm wondering if we can sort of look to the future a little bit. Mm. What do you think are some of the biggest false assumptions that get in our way of tackling torture? Mm. Possibly the biggest thing that when I step back to reflect on on what I you know what I wanted to say in in this book, which was sort of 
as I say, less of an academic expose, but almost sort of a, a reflection on, 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 on this very point. And I'd written it, written, written it all down and think, yeah, 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 yeah. And I reread it. Always very bad to reread what you've written, I discover. Um, and I thought, what's the point of publishing this? There isn't anything here that we don't already know. I'm not saying anything in this book. Or perhaps I shouldn't say this. The publisher will, will not like it. I don't know that I'm saying anything in the book that we all don't know anyway. But in a sense, that's precisely the point. We all know it, but we just pretend it isn't the case. So, you know, in international affairs, you know, from international human rights perspectives, you know, much of it is conducted on the international plane. UN operates through Geneva. It works through diplomatic channels. Things take place. Exchanges take place on the floor of the General Assembly and elsewhere and then filter out top down um, et cetera, et cetera. We engage, you know, through ministries of foreign affairs, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely correctly. And I'm not, I don't want me to imply at all that this isn't right or shouldn't be done. But we then tend to overstate the ability, for example, or the traction that, for example, ministries of foreign affairs actually have in many, you know, many countries. They may be the international representatives, but, you know, in some countries, what weight does the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and what it has to say over the Ministry of Interior or the equivalent of the Home Department the, and the policing authorities? The short answer is often extremely little. And so are we really talking to people um, who have really got the authority to make things happen. Take that down to one level. You just pick up any paper or turn on any, look at any website or any news about what goes on in many of the biggest prisons around the world in very many countries. And you will see what we all know, that although the authorities exercise a degree of control, and in some countries, of course, full control over these places, in many, they don't. And that the day-to-day -day experience of what goes on in these places isn't necessarily dictated by the so-called authorities, but by drugs, gangs, internal mechanisms, um, um, you know, you know, criminal groups, or, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't need me to tell you. We know this. Just pick up the papers and read all the stories that come out of it. And yet, when we're looking and thinking about the way that people are subject to ill treatment in prisons, what we tend to do is to talk to the national authorities as if they actually have got the day-to-day -day ability to flip a switch and make sure that any of this doesn't happen. If they could, they would. They want to, but they can't. Or for a variety of reasons, they don't. And so if we're really interested in trying to deal with the problems that many people in detention face and the physical ill treatment that occurs to them, are we talking to the right people? You know, we always talk to the prison authorities. I'm afraid to say much of the ill treatment that takes place, certainly in prisons, less in, police, in policing, but in prisons around the world, is inflicted by other detainees for reasons of corruption, viol gang violence, you name it. That doesn't mean that it's any less than what it is. Now, of course, we could say, oh, well, go back to our definition of torture. It's not torture because it's not afflicted by public authority. It's not purposive. Well, it may be purposive. It doesn't fulfill those definitions. Well, it may not. But for the person who's at the receiving end of what's happening to them, I don't suppose they're going to be terribly impressed by that. Um, so it's these sort of things. You know, who runs prisons? Corruption, the effect of corruption on the way in which criminal justice systems operate, we sort of know all this, but do we actually factor it into the way in which we deal with authorities or understand what's the driver of so much ill, Ill treatment in um in, in, in so-called criminal justice systems? Well, we didn't used to. I think we, we've got it better now. And if there's one thing I'm particularly proud about about my time with the SBT, I, I think we were the first body really driven by what we'd seen happening in practice going into these places that actually produced um, um, a, a, um, a document, a position, a comment highlighting the interface between torture and corruption 
um, in, 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 um, in detention. This has now become a lot more commonplace. The UN Special Rapporteur did a f much more thorough job some years um, later in exploring this in one of their reports in detail. But it's putting these new things on the map that people sort of know about but don't just normally come up because they're a bit uncomfortable in the, in the context of normal human rights discussion. But in a sense, the biggest false assumption, um, and I did mention this this earlier, but I think it bears mentioning again, is that the torture and ill treatment in place of detention somehow is sort of rare, and it isn't. You know, the models that we have are still very much a bit like the UN definition of torture, still resonant, re resonate almost like with the medieval torture chamber or its modern equivalents where, you, as I say, you have a vulnerable person and someone comes in deliberately to inflict exquisite tortures on them in order to extract information for a given purpose. And it happens. It happens frequently. That happens far too much. And But is that the real model of most torture in most countries most of the time? Probably not. Most torture, and for the people who receive it, it is torture, is routine, widespread, just part of the way that things are done. And that's the bit that I think prevention and the sort of things we do can really do something about. Is it really going to stop you know, the, the more, let us call it, I don't like this expression, but the more traditional classical model of torture that is in our minds? Frankly, probably not. But is it going to be able to do something about this vast swathe of torture and ill-treatment that happens just because it happens and no one can be bothered to do very much about it? Oh, yes, that can be dealt with. Very helpful in a way, despite um, kind of sounding like a list of problems, uh, there's nevertheless useful nuances of what might be more or less possible. But speaking of uncomfortable truths, um, the book doesn't just focus on what's happening in the detention centres, you also outline some issues within the UN and the international system that also are getting in our way a little bit. I'm wondering if you can maybe outline those? Well, they, they come in different guises. Um, at, at one level, and I've, again, I, I mentioned this um, a, a little earlier, the amount of the, 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 the I'm trying to find, think of the right word here, capacity isn't, is, 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 isn't the right word, the, the, the ability, the, if you like, the theoretical ability of the mechanism I work with to do far more to address torture around the world is, 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 is huge. Do I think if it released that potential and acted and did more, it would make a difference? Of course I do. I wouldn't have spent this much of the year or even bothered to write the book if I didn't think that it didn't. So, yes, a huge amount more can be done. Some things are as boring as they sound, and that is, you know, yeah, I hesitate to say, say it, but the lack of resource which is made available to the doing of this within the UN system, and I don't just mean our bit i mean human rights protection overall is 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 just just laughable when you you know it tragically laughable when you see the amount of money which is spent on so many other things and the next to nothing which is spent on 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 things of of, of this nature as i once remarked in um in in one body i think it was in new new new, new york when there was yet another round of meetings to discuss the problems of better protecting you know, human rights through the UN and how this can be done and that could be done. I said, look, if the amount of money that was spent on Canapé in meetings in New York to discuss the problem was actually spent in dealing with it, we wouldn't have the problem. Um, and, you know, there is never a shortage of money within the UN to discuss problems. The problem, the shortage is is actually addressing them. And that's something that we just need to be a little bit more honest about. And I think that then becomes the leap motive to too much of the rest of the problems here. We just need to be willing to be a little bit more honest about some of the, the problems, but also some of the even then the solutions that we offer. Again, 
I just mentioned some of them. We tend to expect, you know, in an international system, it's an interstate system. States are meant to be in control of their countries. So we see them as being in control of the countries. So we talk to them as if they are, even when in truth we know that they may not always be, or they may not always have the ability to exercise their authority in the way that they claim that they are. And we find it awkward to point out to them that they're not. Likewise, we refuse to recognize or to engage with those bodies that are capable of affecting efficient and effective control over things that matter to people because they're not really meant to be doing it. So we marginalize them and don't talk to them. You know, we readily accept that all countries are signed up to the principles of the rule of law when in truth we know that they're not. Um, Perhaps more graphically, you know, from a human rights perspective, the answer in in many instances, if we look at the, you know, even in the area in which I work in torture prevention, some of the key um, safeguards for people against torture and ill treatment, particularly when they're first taken into detention, really rely on professionals. The ability to have readily access to a lawyer, to be able to be um, medically examined by a doctor in, or a medic in order to make sure that you know we know what a person's physical condition is when they're first taken into detention. The, the requirement that they're quickly taken before a judicial authority in order to make sure that their detention is lawful, legitimate and legal and subject to proper scrutiny and challenge. All these are hugely important if they work well. But I'm sorry to say, the number of occasions in which you just have to accept that lawyers don't always give very good advice, don't turn up or just can't be bothered, and that judges can be, you know, likewise, not that interested, corrupt, that doctors, again, do they always do the job that they should be doing? No, we assume that professionals will act as professionals in accordance with our lights, but often that is not the case. And sometimes you can understand why. You just look at the conditions and situations in which they are working and they don't have the opportunity of being so. Others just don't want to be. Um, So we just keep sometimes projecting standards which are not solutions, just telling people they shouldn't do things are pointless also if they just can't, if there are other practical reasons why it's just not possible to tell them to do it. What's the point of telling people to ensure that someone is taken before a a judicial authority to confirm the legality of their detention within within 24 or 48 hours if there physically isn't a courtroom or a place where they can get to in that time in order for that to happen? but we still keep telling them to do it, and so on and so forth. Um, And so, you know, but, but because of this, we also then sometimes have a tendency to make the solution to many of these these problems more difficult than they really are. And I think one of the things that shocked me as much is when you've gone into so many places of detention, and you can think little things could be done here that are just so easy that would make a huge difference to the lives of the people who were here, being held particularly in inhuman and degrading conditions, and therefore being treated in an inhuman and degrading manner, which is absolutely prohibited, and it doesn't take much to make a difference. And yet people just have got so normalised or desensitised to what's going around them that it just doesn't happen. And then when you raise it, what sort of response do you get? I vividly remember, and I'm not going to go into details, of being in one country and in one um, incredibly overcrowded prison uh, police cell where there were, where people had been held for very long periods, by which I mean days and days and days. As a police cell, there was no sanitation available. You would not even want me to begin to describe the nature of the conditions in which people were being housed. And I do definitely, I raised this obviously with the people both at the spot afterwards and, and, and I was told, yeah, 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 you're right. They need, they need more human rights training. To which I just stared at them and said, no, they don't. They need to be trained and encouraged to use a bucket and a mop. It's not that difficult to do little things that make enormous differences. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for taking us through that. And I think it gives 
a lot of things to think about and a lot of things for readers to take away. Um, the combination of the kind of high politics and legal aspects coupled importantly with the really practical on the ground nature of this so thank you for taking us through both sides and so effectively linking them together my final question is simple for me to ask probably less simple to answer um the book is obviously available um you are now primarily at oxford um not traveling all over on spts is there anything you might be working on now or next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to preview? Well, you always think that you've you 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 you've done and said the last thing that you're going to do on something, and and writing this book was um, w- was important to me. Possibly, you know, this um, th- this conversation has highlighted why it's to try to reflect on uh, that experience and to try to. Yeah, head scratch a little about why when there's just so much work being done, excellent work being done um, around human rights, torture, torture prevention, it's still not having the effect that you would think that it ought to have. And I, I should say, completely up front. I'm not the first to write books like this. Um, in the past, some, some good friends of mine who've also held, you know, m- you know figures within um, the, the, the international human rights community, and particularly on torture, have written, you know, in different eras, in different ways, books that are some way are not dissimilar, head scratch in their own experience. You know, why is it when we know all this, we don't seem to be able to do things about it? I suppose for me going forward, having written this book, I, I, I'm, I, I'm talking about now now writing a, a different sort of um, book on on this, but I'm also, you know, actively exploring going back to agendas that were on the table about trying to transform and change the way in which the UN human rights systems work to make them more attuned or able to work better with what is really going on in country rather than frankly in the somewhat more rarefied discussions that take place in in, in other places you know informed by perhaps more should we say theoretical and political positions rather than if you like the brute realities that we all know are happening on the ground but somehow these discussions have got somewhat distanced from well a very important project so best of luck with that and of course while you're working on it listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled tackling torture prevention in practice published by bristol university press malcolm thank you so much for being with us on the podcast my pleasure thank you very much indeed